So before we get into the main content, I just want to start with a few acknowledgements. Um, Dr. Judy Kim, who is co-organizing this workshop with me. Um, Lauren Wilkins, who has done a ton of behind the scenes work to make all of this happen. Uh, Dr. Walter Sinnott Armstrong, um, my co-PI on the grant that is funding this workshop and our funders, the John Templeton Foundation. So to start, what is this workshop actually about? What do we mean by moral narratives? So broadly, we define moral narratives as communication about the moral actions and characters of people. Some examples of moral narratives include gossiping about someone at work, competing accounts of the same morally fraught event, like a divorce or a murder, political propaganda and conspiracy theories, and even the stories we tell ourselves about ourselves. I'm gonna hold off on giving a more specific definition of what exactly we think a moral narrative is because one of the main goals of this workshop and bringing all of these great minds together um, is to figure this out together as a group collaboratively. And we really wanna explicitly recognize that there is a ton of scholarship on aspects of what we're interested in, including how narratives persuade audiences, their role in identity formation, and the uniqueness of narrative as a form. And so one goal is to really understand how different disciplines have theorized uh, narratives in general and moral narratives specifically, especially from diverse cultural and political perspectives. Um, so towards this aim, we've invited participants from different fields who are studying narratives in various forms. Now, as cognitive scientists, we're interested specifically in the cognitive processes and mechanisms involved in how moral narratives are communicated and understood. So we're really emphasizing here how people construct moral narratives and why they do so. And so on one hand, we're going to zoom in on the minds of narrators their goals, their inferences, their positionality, and their decision processes. On the other hand, we want to put this process in context and specifically understand narrators and narratives as fundamentally embedded in historical, material, social, and political contexts. So to do this effectively, we are bringing together in this workshop scholars and, and practitioners um, studying narrators and narratives from diverse perspectives, including psychology, philosophy, economics, neuroscience, linguistics, literature, communications, and journalism. And specifically what we wanted to do is pair scholars working from different perspectives together to address uh, similar or bridging kinds of topics. Now, I think this is a really excited, exciting and impressive group and list of fields, but I want to say at the outset that this is really only the tip of the iceberg, and we are hoping that this workshop will be just the start of hopefully many conversations going into the future so that we can cover the vast scholarly territory um, that we're not going to even begin to, to fully cover in this, in this brief workshop. Um, so I'm going to give a very broad, um, quick overview of all the sessions. Um, our first session today brings together a, a cognitive scientist and a psychologist um, who are looking at moral narratives at the individual and collective levels and really a broad conversation about um, introducing this topic. Our second uh, workshop will um, bring together a philosopher and a psychologist to look at this question of point of view, um, the co-creation of narrator narratives by narrators and audiences. Session three is gonna focus on deception and bringing together a psychologist and a linguist um, to look at both the development of and the cognitive processes involved in these sort of uh, interplay between um, speakers and audiences specifically uh, in, in cases of, uh, of maybe bending the truth. And our fourth uh, session brings together a philosopher and a journalist um, to further uh, explore like what it is that we even mean by truth and how the frames of narratives create dependencies and how audiences can understand what's being communicated. 
session five uh, brings together a philosopher and a behavioral scientist um, to look at narratives in the context of victims and the criminal justice system and to explore how epistemic injustices can arise um, in the context of these systemic uh, processes. Um, our sixth session brings together a philosopher, neuroscientist, and a uh, literary scholar and novelist um, to explore the relationship between autobiographical memory and forgiveness. And finally, our last session uh, broadens out our discussion uh, to look at public narratives, um, bringing together a journalism and communication scholar and a discourse studies scholar to look at questions of science communication, crisis communication, and propaganda. And um, finally, I'm very, very excited to introduce uh, our fellows. These are early career scholars who are studying moral narratives from a variety of different perspectives, and they are going to be um, continuously uh, participating in this workshop across all the sessions and helping us to bridge together the insights that arise during um, the presentations and the discussions. So I'm so excited to introduce this and um, to uh, start with our, um, our first talk of the day. I am excited to introduce um, Dr. Judy Kim, who is a fellow at Princeton's University Center for Human Values. Thanks, Molly. Um, can everyone see my slides? Okay. Um, okay. Yeah, I just wanted to start off by saying I'm also really excited and really um, nervous, but mostly excited. Um, so I'm going to jump right in. Um, why study moral narratives? Well, since you're already here, you probably don't really need to be sold on this question. Um, some of you might already be interested in moral narratives because you've noticed they kind of seem to be everywhere in public, in our public lives, and across cultures even. And moral narratives seem to have a lot of functions, um, maybe in how we understand or sometimes misunderstand each other. So you might be interested in their role in things like moral judgment or belief formation and change, um, why we have interpersonal conflicts and how we resolve them or moral narratives also seem really important for how we come to understand ourselves. You might also be interested um, in moral narratives because they seem just like an interesting and unique kind of communication that seems meaningfully different from things like explanation, instruction, or um, event sequences. And so if your topic is listed here, you might already in fact be studying moral narratives even if you don't think in those terms. And we think that developing a framework for understanding really what moral narratives are in this collective interdisciplinary public and kind of an experimental way um, will hopefully inspire new insights to those other areas of research, but also selfishly um, for those um, of us who care about understanding just narratives for um, their sake, um, think that um, uh, our understanding of the topic will massively be enriched by connecting with all of you. And so to kick us off, I'm going to present how um, we've been studying this topic, um, acknowledging that this is just one starting place and approach, um, but hopefully that will provide um, enough of a good starting place for us to really build on in today's discussion afterwards, but across all of these sessions um, as well. So what do we really mean by moral narrative? Um, to give you an example, Here's a scene from a movie called Marriage Story, where a character is played by Scarlett Johansson and Adam Driver are going through a divorce and they're having a really nasty fight as divorcees do. And in this scene, um, ScarJo has alluded to the fact that Adam Driver actually cheated on her during their marriage. And it's now Adam Driver's turn to address the event. And this is what he says. He says, yes, I slept with her, but there's so much I could have done. I was a director in my 20s. I was hot shit. I wanted to sleep with everyone and didn't. You wanted so much so fast. You hated me. There's so much I didn't do. And this um, is characteristic of what we're calling moral narratives, but I'll really unpack what I mean by that in the following ways. So first I'm gonna um, set some really basic boundary conditions constraining under what context we think moral narratives are told and then build um, from theoretical work from philosophy. Um, I'll describe what kinds of information moral narratives communicate, and in doing so, also try to talk about what they might not be. And then this is where kind of our um, cognitive science bent comes in. Um, I'll try to connect this theoretical definition and description with a um, cognitive and computational model for how individual narrators might decide what to say. 
where the goal and theory part of this enterprise will then be to explain what moral narratives are based on why and how they're told. So linking these two levels together. I'll also quickly show some data from experiments um, testing predictions from this framework to give you a sense of the kinds of experiments and methods that we use, um, and then end with future directions and limitations. So when are moral narratives told? Well, first off, we're interested in narratives told about people as moral agents in relation to particular events they were involved in. So really basically for a moral narrative to be told, some event has to have occurred in which a person acted in a way that would typically elicit moral judgment. And here we mean moral judgment in a pretty broad sense. So the person's action could range from really obviously bad things like committing a murder or good like um, saving a life, but also some morally ambiguous things like um, an actual dilemma, like is harming one person to save many others um, that could be spun either way. And second, um, moral narratives we think are told always in a commutative um, context, communicative context, um, where there's always a narrator and an audience. And since we're interested in narratives about people, the narrators are always talking about a person as well, whom we're calling the target of the narrative. These three roles could actually take on a lot of different forms. So if they're all different people, like you and your friend are gossiping about another friend, you have a third person narrative. If you're talking about yourself, that would be a first person narrative. If your audience is also yourself, we'll call that a self narrative. And for exposition um, today, I'm mostly going to focus on first person narratives. So precisely what then are moral narratives? Well, the philosopher Greg Curry, who's one of our speakers, um, has developed a theory of narrativity in general. Um, and according to him, some key elements of narratives are that they contain details about particular events and people. They explain causes in a coherent way and have an evaluative tone that comes from the narrator. And so we adapt this definition to moral narratives specifically, where we have um, communication that de details particular agents and their moral actions in an explanatory way that invites moral evaluation. And you saw sort of, um, some of that in this example where um, it describes a particular person's moral actions. So Adam Driver sleeping with this other person. This is explanatory and evaluative. Um, he did it because he was hot shit who could have slept with anyone. And it was in fact um, her fault that he did it. He's justified. Um, and as a result of such information being provided, it invites you to make a particular evaluation of his moral character, that is, um, that he's not such a bad person. A question that we can ask is, well, why do moral narratives contain these elements? According to Curry, narratives are also intentional communicative artifacts that are intentionally constructed to serve the communicative goals of their makers. And so one answer from that is that these elements are there because that's what narrators wanted to communicate. And then a further implication of this definition is that narratives don't just contain every single detail that a narrator has witnessed or experienced of the event in question, right? If you think about it in this example, there's all kinds of things Adam Driver could have said that could have been actually true of the cheating event, like what the weather was that day or all the details, other details about his actions, like maybe did he initiate the cheating, different explanations, like did he care, not care about Scarlett Johansson at all um, while he was doing it? And so as a narrator, um, what I'm driver's doing is selecting and highlighting only certain kinds of information. And so in that way, a moral narrative isn't just an impartial description or a straightforward reflection of reality, but instead it contains the narrator's own subjective viewpoint. And it's also important to note here that we can talk about viewpoint actually at multiple levels. So in this case, you can tell Adam Driver kind of wants you to infer based on this narrative that he's not a bad person, right? But he isn't just straight up telling you that abstract evaluation either. He's not just saying, I'm not a bad person, believe me. Instead, he's giving you the right kinds of information to lead you to that evaluation yourself, like his actions and um, motivations, which we know from moral psychology that um, they are in fact really crucial for moral judgment. So to summarize um, what moral narratives do then is describe moral actions of particular people at a level of detail that's on the one hand, not just every detail of experience, but is instead filtered through um, the narrator's interpretation. But on the other hand, it's not so abstract either and it rather invites you to make um, a particular evaluation of who they are based on the details. And this kind of framing and highlighting information in narratives is something I think um, Rachel Frazier and maybe others um, uh, we'll talk about in this workshop as well.
Now, trying to draw really clear boundaries around what is or isn't strictly a narrative is actually pretty thorny. And so we're going to follow Curry to say narrativity is actually a continuous characteristic where you can have high and low narrativity depending on some of the dimensions that I mentioned. For example, say a narrative isn't very explanatory, like Adam Driver just says, yeah, I slept with her and leaves it at that. Or it doesn't provide particular details about what um, he did, like his actions and just give some vague justifications. Or um, imagine if he had said something really vague and weird, like, um, I don't, I've never understood why you're like this. These um, examples below are low in moral narrativity compared to the one at top because they're missing information that helps you make a clear moral evaluation of character. And importantly, you can actually kind of imagine hearing all of these in real life. And so to talk about how and why moral narratives are told, we consider um, an aim to explain how and why all of these different ones are told. That is, um, in a way, what we're interested in is not just um, why narratives with high moral narrativity, like canonical good moral narratives are told, but why they might not be told given similar discourse contexts. So as I move on um, to how and why are moral narratives told, the explanatory task then becomes linking these cognitive mechanisms and functions we wanna study um, to why we see varying levels of moral narrativity in reality. <clears throat> So how are moral narratives told? Well, I've already kind of hinted at one answer in um, Curry's definition, right? That narratives are told to serve the narrator's communicative goals. But to be pre more precise about what that means, um, we turn to this pretty popular computational model in cognitive science, namely a type of Bayesian model called the Rational Speech Act or RSA. And I'm not gonna go into too much detail about this and just highlight some key concepts in this model that's important for us. One is that we agree that people likely decide what to say by making inferences about what their audience will think. And another um, is that communicate, communicators evaluate a set of possible things to say um, and value them according to how well they meet whatever goals they have and pick the one that ends up with the highest value. Particular instances of this RSA model kind of differ in studying different sets of possible goals that communicators then have. Um, like sometimes we, people study whether um, people have goals to be polite or funny. And so the question for moral narratives then becomes what goals do narrators of moral narratives have? One default one that's kind of there in any communicative context is whether um, they want to be informative. They have to decide whether they want to reveal their uh, subjective viewpoint on what they believe to be the truth. But because we're also talking about people, um, narrators will often also have a reputational goal, how they want the audience to think about um, the moral character of the target, which in first person um, case would be themselves. And in um, a lot of our everyday life, informational and reputational goals can conflict where you might want to compromise informativity because the truth is that you did something bad and you actually kind of want to appear better than you believe yourself to be. Like in the marriage story example, Adam Driver, um, you saw was trying to justify or, de or um, defend himself after a blameworthy act. And so in these conflict um, goal conflicting cases, um, it's straightforward what a narrator who prioritizes informational goals should do. Um, they should just tell the truth, even if it makes them look bad. Whereas a narrator who prioritizes a reputational goal can just lie and forget about informational um, goals completely. Both of these would actually possibly involve telling narratives with high narrativity, um, just that one's true and one would be false. Both of these options actually, however, come with big trade-offs. Um, if you do something really morally bad, telling the truth means risking a bad reputation, um, but lying is also potentially really costly, especially for find out. And so what about a narrator who wants to balance the two goals? Um, well, one prediction we've made and um, tested in um, one of our studies is that um, this may actually be the reason why some people um, tell low narrativity narratives um, is because by not saying much at all, um, you neither have to tell an uncomfortable truth um, nor lie. So this is kind of one of the predictions that we've um, uh, been thinking about um, coming out of this framework. In other words, um, we decided to ask in this experiment, I'm going to show you um, can um, how narrators balance or trade off these two different goals predict different levels of moral narrativity. And so I'll very quickly run through um, results from one of the studies testing this. <clears throat> 
So we have this very basic setup um, where online participants first make some moral decision, um, which in this case means claiming a raise to their earnings, which then raises the chance that a coworker is going to lose their earnings. Um, these participants then become narrators where they're told that they have to communicate with an audience who will judge them and can either take their money away or give them extra money based on what they say to them. And what's interesting about this moral decision task they had to do um, is that the decision to take this raise has to be ba um, based on a lot of uncertain outcomes, like the coworker could lose money if you make that selfish choice, but not necessarily. And the money at stake also isn't super high. And so there is lots of wiggle room for narrators to come up with various justifications for their own behavior. Um, and when we ask people to provide free responses to, hey, what would you like to say to the audience? We, in fact, see a variety of answers and importantly, varying levels of moral narrativity. Um, so here are some coded um, free responses. Some people just lie and say they didn't take the raise, even though they did. Um, about 20% of people tell the truth and give an explanation. So um, I claim the raise um, because my coworker still had a 50% chance to keep their $1. So what I didn't wasn't that bad. And this um, example is high in moral narrativity, right? Because it has both an action and an explanation. And the rest of the people actually kind of do neither. Um, they tell sometimes really ambiguous uh, narratives where they're like, I did what I needed to do. Um, they describe an action that's not really relevant, work hard at this puzzle. Um, and a lot of people describe no action at all, um, like innocent until proven guilty, or they describe the task itself like, oh, this is a really hard thing to do. Um, but importantly, gas yes, narrators love telling these vague narratives um, and you see different levels of narrativity. In our main experiment then, we also directly manipulated narrativity where narrators had to choose one of um, the options that we gave them. For specifically, we manipulated these um, two elements of narrativity, so whether they contain actions and explanations in a two by two design. So it can contain a truthful or a vague action or a truthful or vague explanation resulting in four narratives with different levels of narrativity. And so a truthful action would just admit to, I decide to claim the race. As a counterpart, we had this vague statement that said, um, this was a weird experiment. For a clear explanation, we said, um, I really didn't care about what happened to the coworker. And we picked a selfish explanation. Um, so there's kind of a reputational motivation not to say it, even if they believe it's to be true. And then there was the vague equivalent where um, it, it said, I would be um, interested to see the final results of the study. And so you end up with this full narrative that's very high in moral narrativity, this very vague one that's low, and then these two um, in between. And then for each of these four narratives, we asked, how likely are you to show this? Um, and then for to get informational value, we asked, do you agree with the statement? And for reputational value, we asked, um, can you guess how the audience will adjust your bonus, whether to give more or take away from you. And um, the main prediction is that um, the value in terms of both of these goals will affect narrative choice if narrators indeed often try to balance these two things, um, and that might result in narratives with low moral narrativity being chosen often. And so here's how narrators value these four narratives um, in uh, reputationally. They think um, telling the full truth, um, the AE, of course, might lead to some punishment um, and then informationally, um, they agree with um, the narrative with just the action. Um, but what's really important here is that as we predicted, um, narrators actually, actual preferences and choices for the narratives are most um, predicted by a combination of these two goals rather than either goal alone. And um, the two most vague narratives are chosen a lot um, precisely because as we predicted, they don't reveal what they actually did, um, nor are they really false. And so that's just like a taste of um, experiments we've run, um, and that's the result um, end of my results. Now, um, one kind of limitation that these tightly controlled lab studies like this one have, of course, is that they're not very realistic um, and flatten out some important factors that likely also affect what more why moral narratives get told. Um, for example, we didn't really talk about the relationship between narrators and audiences or who they are, like their identities or um, places in society. Um, and that is kind of one of the things that we want to look at next. Um, for example, the role of power differentials between um, narrators and audiences and how they might engage in a kind of epistemic um, power struggle. And we also think that while we're starting in a pretty small corner within this huge topic that's moral narratives, um, this kind of framework can be built out easily. 
Um, so we can think about, does this model work for all kinds of configurations of narrator target and audience? For example, what implication does it have for how we tell narratives to ourselves? Um, what do we really mean by person? Could we apply this to groups of people or institutions or abstract concepts and so on? And really hope that this framework can be um, generative in this way. So with that, um, I'd like to thank Molly and my lab and stop. And I think I actually um, have to hand over now um, to Kate, um, who I think will present a very different but awesome broadened out perspective on moral narratives. Hi, I think um, I think I'm here and Lauren, I trust that you will tell me if something is is amiss. Um, I think that that everything, everything looks great. Okay, thank you. Um, thanks, Judy and and Molly and Lauren um, for for organizing this. Um, yes, Judy, I think it's going to be a little bit different, but that's what's fun about this. Um, so I just will say I as Molly said, I am a psychologist. I'm a developmental psychologist. And briefly, I just want to mention what I study because it's relevant to what I'll be talking about. Um, I'm interested in narrative identity development. So I study adolescent and emerging adults primarily and how they figure out who they are and how they fit into the world they live in, the society and the culture they live in. And I'm particularly interested in the cultural and interpersonal context of narrative identity development and um, this, the sort of larger cultural um, values and stories that youth are working with as they figure out their place in the world. So um, Molly asked me to, to uh, talk a little bit about this paper that my good colleague and I, uh, Moin Syed, um, recently wrote. And so I'm just going to give you sort of the highlights of the paper, um, and hopefully it's enough to get some good conversation going. Um, so when thinking about this workshop, I am really excited about this. I And before getting into the, the, the topic of the paper, I just I posed my, um, a couple of questions to myself. Um, that I'll pose to all of you um, that I've been thinking about. So the first question when I when I started thinking about this was whose morality are we talking about? And whose values are we talking about that are in those moral narratives? I ask this question of myself a lot, but what function do moral narratives serve? Um, what function do these stories serve? Who do they serve? Who's benefiting from these moral narratives? And then do these moral narratives uphold or disrupt what we know to be an inequitable status quo in the societies that, that most of us live in who are here on this Zoom call. And these questions come out of what Moyne and I have been writing about for several years, which we call a structural psychological approach to human functioning. So in our approach, we are centering um, the context of human development, in particular the systems and structures of society that most often serve to maintain inequitable power structures. Um, this centering of systems and structures is pretty absent in psychological science, science not fully absent. Um, there are definitely people doing this kind of work, but fairly absent where we're pretty narrowly focused on the individual, usually to the neglect of context. Um, so that's sort of the framing that I, that I bring to, to the next 15 minutes or so of, of discussion with you all. So this paper that, that Moyne and I wrote um, was applying the structural psychological approach to the good life. And I'll say at the outset that I'm not an expert in the good life, neither of us are. Um, but our argument is that you can take this approach really to any domain in psychology. So here are some examples of the good life to get us all on the same page. Um, a life well lived from the perspective of the person living it, as opposed to a purely objectivist perspective. Basic need satisfaction, material and social capital, hedonic satisfaction, eudaimonic meaningfulness, moral virtues, wisdom, growth, and other qualities of human flourishing. It seems to include moral and prudential values so that a person would not be said to be living a good life no matter how psychologically happy she was unless her life met a certain moral standard. So we have here broadly are this sort of emphasis on subjectivity, um, on human flourishing and all these sort of good um, things uh, and, and morals and values. And all of this can kind of go under the, the umbrella of positive psychology, which I'm gonna guess most people here are are pretty familiar with. And just to add a few more um, quotes from some celebrities and from some positive psychologists who are sort of psychological celebrities, I suppose. Um, Oprah tells us that the great courageous act that we must all do is to have the courage to step out of our history and past so that we can live our dreams. Uh, we can change our lives. We can do, have, and be exactly what we wish. Probably the biggest insight is that happiness is not just a place, but a process, an ongoing process of fresh challenges. And it takes the right attitudes and activities to continue to be happy. 
And the truth is bad things don't affect us as profoundly as we expect them to. That's true of good things too. We adapt very quickly to either. So there's a lot we could discuss um, here, but what I would like to, to focus on for this talk is that all of these quotes about the good life, um, most of what we see in positive psychology and what these um, individuals are, are focusing on here is the person. It's an extraordinarily myopic, solo, zoomed in view on one person with as if they're floating in the ether without any kind of context around them at all. Um, these bad things that might be happening, we have no idea what they are. We have no idea if they're interpersonal, if they're structural, is this systemic racism or gender-based violence or a divorce as Judy was talking about. There's just no kind of context at all for any of these um, uh, quotes that I've given you. And this is not something, what I'm about to say is not something that the scholars in these areas um, say, but the logical conclusion from this kind of approach is that if a person isn't living a good life or isn't experiencing well-being or happiness, that it's their fault, right? So you just need to get the right activities going, right? And have the right attitudes. And there are entire disciplines in psychology focused on shifting people's mindsets, for example. So this, ex this extraordinary focus on the individual really neglects um, the context that I wanna focus on today. And I think this, this idea of this individual pursuit of happiness, this agentic and individual pursuit of happiness and the good life um, is a value and it's a moral narrative about how to be happy. So what Moyne and I have been working on um, is as I mentioned, the structural psychological approach. And as I said, uh, we argue that you can really apply this to most um, content domains in, in psychology. We focus on identity development. That's what, that's what we study. And um, I'll talk a bit about that today, but we kind of took the opportunity in this special issue to, to apply it to the concept of the good life. So let me give you a very brief overview of our approach and how we think about um, structure and psychology. So we use the term, um, we've adopted the term master narratives um, to understand how individuals are developing their own personal narratives. So I mentioned I study narrative identity development. And as people are beginning to understand who they are, they're using the available cultural templates for how to be a person in the society that they're in. So master narratives are shared stories that we all know and, and have access to, at least have access to the, the knowledge of them, about how to belong in the society that we live in. What kinds of events are supposed to happen in our life stories? How are we supposed to interpret and narrate these events? So they're cultural values and expectations. And Moyne and I, um, when we started doing this work, there were lots of reasons that we were drawn to this, but one of them was our dissatisfaction with the use of the word context in psychology. So earlier I said it's often not used, so it's not present in our study designs or questions. And when it is used, it's often pretty vague. Um, and, and maybe most critically, we often see that context and individual are viewed as separate variables. And we very much view in this approach that um, structure and individual can't be separated, that they are intimately connected and intertwined. So in the, in the case of identity development, as people are developing their own personal narrative, they're exposed to these master narratives, these cultural, cultural narratives. When we align with cultural expectations, when we fit in with the stories that, that the way that we're supposed to story the events of our lives, when we tell stories consistent with master narratives, we internalize those master narratives into our own stories. So when I tell a personal story about my life that's culturally expected, I'm engaging in an activity that upholds master narratives. So there's a bi-directional relationship here. It's not just that the master narratives are influencing people. We are also upholding them as we internalize them into our own stories. So let me give you a, a, an example of a master narrative that is quite prominent in studies of the good life. And that's the master narrative of redemption, which most people are probably familiar with. Um, certainly in the United States, this is a very strong master narrative. Dan McAdams has written extensively about this. Um, and the basic idea is that when something bad happens, good follows. So you might experience illness or loss or any kind of um, trauma or major life challenge. And perhaps what happens through time and with time is that you grow from it, or you might um, increase in wisdom or compassion or generativity or sort of these aspects of human flourishing that I mentioned earlier. And in that cultural narrative of redemption that we see everywhere, we see 
in movies and books. And actually, Judy, I can't remember how the marriage story ends, but now I want to go back and see if, if it ends in a redemptive way. Um, but we see it everywhere in, in American life. Certainly, Oprah is a big proponent of redemption, one of the people I cited earlier. Um, and in that narrative, what the cultural values that are being communicated are, again, this individual pursuit of happiness and personal growth. It's the way that individuals interpret their own lives that brings about this redemption. Okay, so that's an example of a master narrative. What I haven't talked about yet is probably the most central component of this model, which is the notion of power. So in our approach, um, and this is often what's, what's missed actually with, with uh, as people adopt or, or write about our approach, I think, um, we can't think about master narrative without thinking about power. So when I talked about telling a personal story that upholds a master narrative, um, if I'm aligning with the master narrative, that maintains the status quo. And the starting point for this model is that we live in a system that is inequitable. So when we're maintaining master narratives, we're maintaining an inequitable status quo. Now, this is the other bubble that I haven't talked about yet, which is the alternative narrative. So of course, not everybody's life and life experiences fit with these cultural expectations, right? So some of us deviate from cultural expectations. And what our research has told us again and again is that people who don't align with master narratives and who are searching for an alternative narrative to help them to, to structure their life and, and narrate their life, those people are much more likely to be marginalized, to be placed on the margins in our society. In some studies, that means by virtue of gender, of race or ethnicity, of sexual identity. Um, we see again and again that people whose lives don't fit in with these cultural expectations are structurally marginalized. So it's not just that some people align and some people don't and it's value neutral. There's absolutely a power component to understanding how people negotiate and fit in with master and alternative narratives. One other example that I'll give you related to redemption um, and, and how um, structure is or is not visible in our stories is the American bootstraps narrative. So this narrative that someone is born into poverty or um, multiple obstacles works very hard and then succeeds. So this is a story Americans love, politicians love to tell this story, very persuasive. I think we'll be hearing more about that in the workshop. Um, but this bootstraps narrative serves to maintain an inequitable status quo in that the message is, the value is, hard work is what will get you where you need to go. And we know that it's very difficult to climb up the economic ladder. We know that there are systemic and structural obstacles of doing that, and most people don't do that. So when we uphold these redemptive stories about those who have worked hard, we are ignoring the systemic obstacles that most that prevent most people from having that kind of story. Um, when we when we don't hear or when we ignore or we dislike alternative narratives or people whose lives don't fit in with the mainstream, there are a couple of problems um, here that, that are important to, to discuss. So in another line of work that I've been doing, I've been looking um, with a colleague of mine who's a trauma psychologist, looking at stories of sexual assault survivors. And when we first started this research, our aim was actually to show that there was a cultural preference for redemption because ironically, no one had ever asked that question even though we all said that there was. So uh, we designed a center where we had a bunch of different vignettes um, of different types of traumas and we asked people to rate what, whether they liked these stories and ha half the stories of the traumas ended redemptively and half ended negatively. No surprise, everyone likes redemptive, stor redemptive stories which was good, that would have been problematic to explain. So there is a cultural preference for redemption. But then we started to look at the different types of trauma. So we had things like natural disaster, cancer, loss, all, all different types of, of challenging events. And what we found is that the stories told by sexual assault survivors, those stories that were redeemed were still liked more than negative stories. But compared to redemptive stories about other traumas, they were liked less. So even when survivors are telling the culturally expected story, the redemptive story, they're still not getting the full validation that a survivor of cancer gets, for example. And some of our variables were things like, do you like this person? How healthy is this person? Not just do you like their story. So people who aren't fitting in with our expectations are denied um, hearing their stories often. We don't want, we, we ignore their stories. We're denying themselves from a narrative identity perspective. Um, 
we're denying them the potential to fit in, to be validated, to be seen as part of the group. And we're also not hearing stories, particularly those negative stories with negative endings that bring our attention to systems and structures. So if we were listening to the survivors and, um, and appreciating the stories of survivors, we might hear about legal obstacles or obstacles to reporting assault or the um, pandemic of gender-based violence. So when we don't hear or don't like those stories or absorb those stories, we're missing, we're, we're, our attention is being drawn away from um, structures and systems. So I hope it's becoming clear that the notions of the good life, especially defined by things like personal growth and redemption, converge with master narratives that prioritize individualism, the individual pursuit of happiness over context and also over connection with others. So to close, what I'd like to do is offer um, a speculative, uh, a speculation that, that Moyne and I in this paper proposed, um, which is when we think about the good life, what when you take a structural approach to the good life, what else might come up? Um, as we're designing our studies or thinking about um, other ways of defining the good life. So if the master narrative of the good life is happiness, meaning rich, richness derived from your own pursuit of happiness and success and self-actualization, a major potential alternative narrative to this is that the good life is one that consists of meaningful connections to other people. And that this might be especially the case amongst people who are marginalized, right? Amongst people who have been structurally denied access to this master narrative of the good life. So the group connection found in the alternative narrative serves as the foundation for how one's life is subjectively viewed as good, to go back to that priority on subjectivity. There's lots of data on the importance of relationships for happiness and well being in the good life. What's different here, again, is a consideration of power. So it, in the sort of traditional sense, connection with others is usually viewed as a means for developing a positive self-evaluation. That's our standard measure and sort of model with hedonic and eudaimonic well-being, for example. But if you think about this, the risk that those who are deviating from master narratives have for social isolation, so those who are marginalized, not fitting in, not being validated by aligning with the master narratives, then we see that connection becomes central to well-being. And it becomes central to connect with others who have shared your experiences. And in this way, that connection of with, with similar others is not just the route to the good life as we typically access it, but it is the way that the good life is understood. So if these marginalizing social structures that we have restrict access to mainstream conceptions of the good life, we wanna make sure that, 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 that those who, who are deviating are that we're seeing the, the benefit and the utility and the importance of connection with, with others who share similar experiences. Um, so in closing, I'll, I'll just return to those four questions. Hopefully they make a little bit more sense um, after, after talking for a little while. And I just want, just again, want to say this is one example of taking a structural approach. And that alternative interpretation of the good life as connection with others comes from doing different kinds of research. So it definitely comes with doing research from those who are placed on the margins of society, with listening to them, including their stories and, our, um, and, and their experiences in our studies, looking for structure and systems in their stories, meaning centering the context of people's lives. It means various types of research. We've done lots of quantitative research. It also means doing qualitative research. And maybe most importantly, it, it means what, I, um, what I've been phrasing is starting over. So we have all these definitions of the good life. We have multiple measurements that we think are reliable and valid, but we have, um, we as psychologists move so quickly to explanation and prediction, we often just skip over description in the scientific process. And we've used really narrow methods and really narrow samples to come to a lot of definitions that we have. So it takes a little bit of scientific humility to think about starting over. Like, did we miss this whole idea of, of human connection as constituting the good life? Um, so in closing, um, I just want to come back to this idea that master narratives are moral and they're never value neutral. Not everyone does get to live the good life. It's not all in their control. The good life also is about the world that we live in. And I'll, I'll just end with a question that a good colleague of mine, Ani Rogers, has posed, um, which is, what does it mean to be living the good life or to be happy or to experience well-being? 
when we live in such a maladjusted world. So I'll close there and, and look forward to discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kate and Judy, for these presentations, which I think complement each other really well and do a good job of highlighting the, the broad goals of this workshop, trying to bridge the sort of individual micro level with the broad structural macro level. Um, so we have about 10 minutes left and we will take questions from the audience. Um, please use the raise hand function and um, would especially love to hear questions that um, that both of our speakers can respond to. Um, feel free also to type questions or thoughts in the chat. And I am not sure if we'll have time to get to everyone, but I'm really excited to hear uh, folks' thoughts. So we have a question from Walter. So my question is primarily for Judy, but uh, but Kate could might have something to say about it too. The example from the movie was a first person narrative, someone telling a story about themselves. And I just wonder how uh, the reputational goals uh, as an element in your model change when uh, you're telling stories about other people instead of about yourself? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. And it's something, it's a question we get often enough that we should actually um, think about how to articulate um, whether they, like exactly how they'll be different. Because sometimes we say like, yeah, they might be different. Um, so uh, yeah, I I think in the model, like I always talk about it as there's as if there's only one reputation that a narrator cares about and that is about um, that is the reputation of the target but as you point out if you yourself are both the narrator and the target you might actually imagine that there are two separate reputations that you have to care about one as the reputation uh, as the narrator right because you might actually care about um, being honest or like seeming trustworthy. That's kind of like reputational concerns of a narrator that's separate from reputational concerns of the target, which has to do like with what action um, they committed and what the content of the narrative actually is. And so I do actually think um, you could imagine like extensions of this model where you say that there's actually two reputations that someone um, has to keep track of and care about. And in other cases, there's only one reputation and they're merged. Um, and that, that would actually make slightly different predictions about um, what you end up uh, choosing in terms of your narratives. Good, thanks. Other questions from the audience? Emily Foster, or I, I have a, I see Emily Foster, Hansen, then Monvier, uh, and uh, Singe, and then David uh, Camper. Thank you. This is such uh, an interesting um, set of talks, and I'm really happy to be able to um, learn from you all about moral narratives in this workshop. My question is for Kate. And Kate, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, I guess I'm going to call them meta narratives. So narratives about the narratives. So you talked about these master narratives and you talked about alternative narratives. And I'm wondering what you think about the way that people explain why some narratives are the master narrative and why others are the alternative and how this relates to um, people's identify, how people identify with these different narratives or seeking out the alternative and looking for deviations from it. Yeah, great question. Um, when Moyne and I first wrote that paper, we realized very quickly that the model was far too simplistic, but it gets the point across um, to have more complicated conversation. So um, the first thing I'll say is that most people are, like we all can all be aware of redemption as a, as a narrative, but most people are pretty unaware of, of, of the fact that they are aligning with cultural master narratives in their own personal stories. So when we fit in, we don't think, oh, I'm just doing what I'm supposed to do. We think this redemptive story is the most central story to my identity. We're not just doing it because it's a template we're following. So the way that we have determined is, is the best way to figure out what master narratives actually are, because that's one of the critical questions of how do you study them, is to ask people who are deviating. So people who are aligning can't really tell us very much, or we have a couple of different methods um, for kind of getting people to do more of that meta awareness, but it's really much more useful to ask people who are deviating, what's the expectation that you have, that you are not fitting. Um, and I think most, our idea is that internalization of master narratives is a pretty unconscious process for most people. 
um, and that's to preserve their their own identity needs. It, I'm not. Did that answer your question? Generally, okay. great. Monbir is next. Yeah, thank you for both of those talks. Those were fascinating. Sorry, I'm at a cafe, so forgive me if there's like a lot of noise. Um, my question was, I hope I can articulate this. It seems like both of you were talking about quite different things when you use the word narrative. Um, so Judy had provided this definition. This definition, um, Kate, it seemed like in my what you were talking about might be like expectations or like shared. Yeah. I, 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 I'm not sure how I would describe it. So my question for both of you is, to what extent do you think you're talking about a similar phenomenon? Um, and what is the value that we get in using the same word for what seem to be quite different phenomena? I can start if you want, Judy. Or, um, yeah. Yeah, this is a big question in the field of narrative and narrative identity. Um, and uh, I think we're going to hear more about this throughout the workshop. Um, I would argue that anything that I'm talking about does have some temporal structure to it. Um, so we've talked about in my research, I've talked about life scripts as a, as a potential master narrative. So like what events are supposed to happen in your life and in what order? for example. Um, redemption has a sequence of events. Something bad happens followed by something good. So it's different than something like a stereotype, which is sort of just a descriptor of a person or a behavior. But stereotypes can certainly be embedded with and are embedded within larger master narratives. But there's some storied aspect by which I mean temporal order and, and evaluation um, in master narratives. Scripts are another word I think that might be more familiar to cognitive scientists. Um, and I think there is common ground with what we're talking about. I don't know, Judy, do you want to add to, to that? Yeah, I think there's actually a lot of common ground, but agree that like part of, I think, our like biggest desiderata is actually come up with a definition of um, narratives that maybe like different people can agree on. And I actually think, um, so a lot of people talk about many different kinds of structures when talking about narratives. So like very commonly temporal structure, as Kate mentioned, or kind of causal structure. So like sometimes people talk about it almost as if it's just like a causal model or an explanation for why something happens. I think I've recently been thinking about it kind of as like a more like fluff in between, not quite descriptive, um, but not like it doesn't have to be any of those structures particularly, but it's more of a attentional um, uh, like kind of that's what like how sometimes people talk about framing that you're bringing light um, to and highlighting and emphasizing just by the selection of which information to show. Um, you're kind of creating like a loose relationship among them. And so it doesn't explicitly have to be like, this causes this and that's my narrative. It can be like, my narrative contains these factors. And just by virtue of that, that's like a point of view. Um, and so I think like that's kind of in a lot of um, the different kinds of narratives that people talk about, but hopefully we can like fine tune that definition a little more, but it's a great question. All right, I think we've got time for one more question from David. Okay, uh, I'll try to be brief and um, succinct. Uh, but uh, so I suppose this one's for Kate. Um, I'm not, when you speak of this sort of self journey as the, as or not a journey, but this sort of self actualization as the sort of proper meaning of life, it, but it's sort of you, you. It's sort of you have it juxtaposed where it says that also you're you're trying to find connection and meaning. Is this almost as is antithetical, or like again, they're mutually exclusive in a way. And I mean, again, I think that religious services are like a great example of this instance of so many people are trying to find themselves and sort of find a have a spiritual journey or whatever it might be but they sort of subsume themselves in a part of a collective but at the same time they're almost trying to get closer to god if you want to say that i mean do you see these sort of things as juxtaposed to one another or or are they i mean they almost seem to me they seem very almost one in the same in a certain sense that you almost have to subsume yourself to larger cultural narratives 
And again, this almost seems universal, these redemptive narratives. This is not particularly, I think, one culture or another. It's just something built in. I mean, I hate to be nativist, but like there's, it almost seems like a universal thing that you subsume yourself to the groups that you're a part of to find yourself, but also that is sort of the spark to find yourself in a certain way or have a good life in that sense. Yeah, so I think um, I agree that group connection is is something that we all need for sure. Um, but you can see that anywhere, um, and that that sense of belonging comes through fitting into the expectations. What's different is where do you sit in the hierarchy? And so when when we're denied access to these definitions of the good life, um, we're forced to find another way to experience the good life. And so while connection and belonging is certainly present in traditional measures of, of the good life, it's not about the need for that connection because of being structurally marginalized. It's just like, it feels good to, like you're saying, it feels good to connect with other people and to feel like you belong. It's the emphasis on the need for that connection because you're excluded and denied access in other areas of the, the, the society that you live in. So the, the, if you have richness and connection um, in the sort of master narrative of the good life, it doesn't necessarily have to do with structural inequality. But having connection, if you're living within the alternative narrative, is absolutely about experiencing structural inequality. Or I actually should say, it is about structural inequality in the master narrative. You're just at the hot top of the hierarchy, so you're not aware of it. <laughs> that, can, that I, can I ask a brief follow-up? Is that okay? Is that very brief? Brief. Um, uh, would you think, though, that even the people who purport to just be these extremely individualistic, that they're finding it purely out of their own motivation to try and be the best versions of themselves they can be, or in some ways actually not living the best life, that they're sort of self, they're actually duped, or they're they're sort of lying to themselves in a way, and in some ways, they almost have to be come a part of the, the sort of connectedness group in a certain sense, and that this is, this, that's just not a good life, actually. Um. That I feel like I would want to talk about that for like another hour. Um, yeah, yes, I think that connection is important. I guess I'll, I'll say that the people who think all I need is an individual pursuit to be happy, there's probably some relationships going on there. And there are measures of well being that include, you know, the top score you're going to get is if you also have positive relationships with other people, for example. So you might be a little bit less happy if you, if you don't have those. You have lots of autonomy, but not connection. Um, so there are some measures that that emphasize the importance of connection. So just briefly, I'll say, yes, I think you need human connection to be happy and live the good life. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you so much for all these great questions. And thanks again to our speakers. Um, this has been a wonderful first session, and I'm so excited for future sessions. Um, please tune in to our next one, which is Thursday, October 6th with Greg Curry and Monisha Pasupathy. Um, and um, we will be sending out to the mailing list links and um, further information on how to participate. So thank you again for being here today and we hope to see you next time.